Good morning Union Church and welcome back to a Sunday service. This morning I would just like to read from Romans uh, chapter 8 verses 37 to 39 which says in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither heights nor depths or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord and that is a promise we can hold on to this morning um, if we are going through any struggles or if there's anything heavy on our hearts that we would be able to hold on to that as our hope um, and reflect on those words as we worship him this morning. days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love my comfort my shelter tower of refuge and strength let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. At the sound of your name I sing for joy at the work of your hand Forever I love you, forever I'll stand And nothing compares to the promise I have Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your
together, mended and whole. Empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see it now. I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found Was blind, but now I see Oh, I can see it now I can see the love in your eyes Raising yourself down Raising up the broken to light I can see it now I can see the love up the broken to life Good morning. Thank you for joining with me as we come around God's Word this morning. As I was preparing this week, I was reminded of a story of a group of men who went out on a a camping expedition. On the first night that they were camping, they made a big bonfire. And as they sat around the fire that evening, they started exchanging stories. As you know, in those uh, situations, stories can get rather exaggerated. And the subject went from one to another. And finally, they had come to discussing uh, their macho authority in their homes, that they were the boss. And uh, the stories got better and better. And finally, one man blurted out, he said, you know, every time my wife and I have an argument, it ends with her on her hands and her knees in front of me. Well, the other men were quite impressed with this man and they began to ask questions. He seemed a little bit reluctant to answer those questions. And finally, after pressing him, they said, what does your wife say to you? Is she crying as she says sorry? And he said, well, what my wife actually says to me is, get out from under the bed, you coward, and fight like a man. Well, I've entitled my message this morning, Get on your knees and fight like a man. We're in the book of Ephesians. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. We've been speaking about the armor that God gives us for the spiritual battles that we face. And in verse 18, we read the following. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. In the NIV it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
This is what you need to keep in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. In the message it puts it beautifully. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. As I read these verses, it made me think of the time when Karen and I were ready to move into the church manse at Union. The church trustees had worked on the manse. They had done a lot of needed maintenance. And the walls had been painted. The floor had been redone. The electrical wiring had been concealed. It looked beautiful. We went to the house and we saw it and we were ready to move in. But we were told, you can't move in just yet. The reason being was that the power had not been connected. And although there were power sockets there, there were fixtures on the, the wall and light bulbs in those fixtures, there was no power. When the power was finally connected, we were able to move into the manse and enjoy the manse. And you know, we've been looking over the past few weeks at the weapons that God gives us for the spiritual battles that we face. He gives us armor that enables us to face those spiritual battles and to have victory. We're fighting those battles from a position of victory because Christ has already won the war. We've looked at each piece and we've looked at what they represent and how we should apply that in our lives. We spoke about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. God has given us every single piece and it's ready for us to use. But now in verse 18, Paul is saying to us that the armor is not the complete picture. There's still something that is so important. And like the church manse that looked so good, it looked finished, but it didn't have power, so we can be decked out with all the armor of God. But until we plugged into His power, we're not ready to fight the battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul is given us the final piece of the puzzle, the source of our power. In this battle, this power source enables us to use each piece of armor the way it was intended to be used. He says that in order for us to stand and fight and to have victory in the spiritual realms, we need to be on our knees. We need to be praying. We don't simply include prayer in our daily routine. Prayer has to become our lifestyle. This is the cord that binds all the armor together. This is the key that actually turns the armor on and makes it effective. This is what gives the sword of the, er the spirit its edge and allows us to drive back the enemy in the battle. When we look at the way Jesus uh, defeated Satan by using God's word, it's very important for us to remember that before Jesus was tempted, he spent 40 days praying and fasting. And it was that prayer and that fasting that prepared him to use the sword of the Spirit as effectively as he did. Because even with the entire armor in place, if there is no prayer, well then we're simply all dressed up with nowhere to go. As we look through the Bible, you will see again and again, as you look through history, there was never a major victory. There was never a major movement of God. There was never a major breakthrough or an encounter with God that did not involve people coming before God on their knees in prayer. It's when we earnestly come before God in prayer and we communicate with Him that God moves the church was born, it was started when men and women were on their knees praying. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, you see the importance of prayer. Before Jesus taught, he prayed. Before he was about to heal, he prayed. Before he died, he prayed. 
Prayer was essential in the life of Jesus. Every morning he rose and he went to a quiet place and he was on his knees before his father. Christ's entire ministry shows us the importance of prayer. His victory while engaging in spiritual battles was determined by a lifestyle of prayer. Now, Paul mentions prayer as the last thing as he goes through the armor of God. But I want to assure you this morning, it's not just an afterthought. What Paul was doing is he was keeping the best for last, saving the very best for last. Prayer gives us a direct line of communication with God, the God of the universe. Prayer is a privilege that is available to every single believer. Now, before we go into the specifics of warfare prayer that Paul outlines in this passage, I want us to look at some of the fundamentals of prayer. The first thing I want to tell you this morning is that prayer is an awesome privilege. And it affords us many privileges. The first privilege that affords us is that it enables us to approach the throne of God. So often when people pray, it can be very flippant and our prayers can be very self-serving. It can just become a habit and things we repeat again and again. I remember as a young boy, I used to attend Tuesday night prayer meetings with my parents And so often the prayers that people prayed were just repetitions again and again, saying the same things week by week. One of the things they they love to pray for, they love to pray for unsaved loved ones. And uh, it always tickled me when people got a little confused in their repetitious prayers and they prayed for unloved saved ones. And I think maybe that was a little bit closer to the point in some of the churches. But it always tickled me as a young boy. Maybe it was a little bit more accurate. I love hearing my grandson pray. Because every prayer he prays, he starts the same way. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for lawn mowers and for cool things. And once he has thanked the Lord Jesus for lawn mowers and cool things, then he begins to thank the Lord for other things and that's for every time he prays in the morning the evening and at meal times actually i think so often our mealtime prayers just become rituals we're just repeating words and we're not realizing that we're actually approaching the throne of god i think our prayers would be very different if we actually understood the fact that when we pray We are literally coming into the very presence of God. This is an awesome privilege. You know, in the Old Testament, not everybody had access to the presence of God. As a matter of fact, it was only the high priests and some prophets that had access to the presence of God. Most people didn't have that opportunity. Sin had created a barrier and God's presence was protected. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the temple was separated by a thick curtain. When the high priest went in once a year to offer his sacrifice, he had to have a rope tied around his ankle in case he died in the presence of God. No one else could go in and fetch him so they would be able to pull him out. But you know, we're told That when Jesus accomplished victory on the cross for us, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. What was once off limits now became the right and the privilege of everyone who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can now access the very presence of God. We can enter the throne room and deal directly with him. And we don't have to come with fear and trembling. We come to God with confidence. We come knowing that we have the right to be there through faith in Jesus Christ. And then we're told in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We approach the throne of grace with confidence. Prayer ushers us into the throne room, into the presence of God. And it's the privilege of prayer that we have to approach the presence of God. Another privilege that we have through prayer 
is to acknowledge our dependence on God. As a general rule, as humans, we're stubborn and we're proud. You know that when you spend a bit of time with a two-year-old and you're trying to help them do certain things, you'll hear them say again and again, no, I do it, I do it. There's always emphasis on me and I. From the time we're born, we strive to be self-sufficient. We want to handle things on our own. And you know, that can flow into our relationship with God. And it can keep us from experiencing blessings in our lives. For many people, prayer becomes a last resort. After I've attempted everything else, then I'll pray. Prayer acknowledges that we can't do it all on our own. Prayer acknowledges that we don't have all the answers. We're dependent on God. When we learn to pray first, before we go and try everything else, and rather than using prayer as a last resort, we'll begin to see God accomplishing great things in our lives. We need God. Jesus says in John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can experience and accomplish so much more when we're connected and dependent on God. When we depend on him for everything we need, he will meet those needs. Prayer acknowledges the reality of our dependence on God. Once we understand that, we're able to move not only from the presence of God and acknowledge our dependence on Him, but we're able to access His power. And that's the third privilege we have in prayer, is accessing the power of God. Moses accessed the power of God, and the Red Sea parted. Elijah accessed the power of God, and fire came down from heaven. David accessed the power of God, and Goliath was slain. Joshua accessed the power of God, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Nehemiah accessed the power of God, and he was able to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Peter, John, Paul, and the other apostles accessed the power of God, and the demons were cast out of people. Lame walk, deaf heard, and even the blind saw, and the dead were raised. These were great and godly people, but they were simply people, humans like you and I. It was not their great power, but the power of God that they accessed through prayer. The reality of prayer is that you can be the weakest Christian. And at any period of time in your life, at any moment of the day, in any circumstances, you can cry out to God and instantly have the resources of an infinite sovereign God at your disposal. As you cry out to him, prayer gives us that access to the very power of God. Are you accessing his power through prayer? The final thing I want to say this morning is prayer affords us the privilege of asking God for direction. We don't have to do life on our own. We don't have to make the tough decisions of life on our own. The Bible tells us that God has a plan for our lives, a good plan for our lives, that he wants to lead us and guide us and direct us. He wants to show us the way. But for some of us, it's so hard to ask God to lead and to guide and to direct us, just to stop and to ask him to show us the way. They say that many men will not stop and ask for directions even when they're lost. And I guess I've done that sometimes myself. Why? Why don't you stop and ask for directions? Well, then you've got to acknowledge you're lost. And that's exactly with us. When we ask for God, God for directions, we're acknowledging we're lost. Many of us try to figure out life on our own without asking God for direction. And God wants to help us. We can't do life on our own. God promises us that he'll lead us and direct us. Those who ask him for help, he will show them the way. And he wants to show us the way. 
In the book of Psalms, you read again and again how the men and women of God ask God to lead and direct them. Psalm 31 says, Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. And God did. Psalm 143 verse 10, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. God will lead us. He will direct us when we ask him to be involved in our lives. That's one of the privileges that we have in prayer, to be led and directed by God. We have such a privilege to communicate with God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And in Ephesians, as we read about warfare prayer, we understand the importance of communicating with God in the battles that we are facing, in this warfare. He's won the battle. We need to be communicating with the commanding officer. We cannot have victory if we are not relying on God and relying on his power and accessing his power. You will know that in the military, there's a rigid chain of command. Before any military operation is carried out, the orders are relayed from the commander-in-chief all the way down the chain of command to the soldiers who are actually carrying out the mission. This ensures that everybody stays on the same page. And the smaller operations that are being carried out are in view of the bigger picture of the war. As soldiers, you rely on your commanding officer to give you orders regarding the battle. As we engage in spiritual warfare, there is also a chain of command. God is in control. God knows the bigger picture. He's actually won the war and is dealing with these little battles that we are, or, or, or that we are fighting in. He relays the orders to each one of us through his spirit. And he does that each day of our lives. When we're in communication with him and receive those orders, we get a better picture, a clearer picture of the fight that we are involved in. Now, if we see us, ourselves as soldiers of the King of Kings, it would really make no sense for us to enter the battlefield without first spending time with the commander-in-chief and receiving orders from him for that day. That only happens when we pray. You know, I've said this morning, we have the wonderful privilege of prayer for every believer. And the privilege of prayer allows us to approach the throne of God. It enables us to acknowledge our dependence on God. It enables us to access the power of God. It enables us to ask God for directions. I want to challenge you to do that. Next week, we're going to look at the specifics of warfare prayer that Paul speaks of in this passage. But in this coming week, I want to challenge you. Spend time with God in prayer. It's an incredible privilege. Take hold of that privilege. Acknowledge that you need God. Come into his very presence. Acknowledge your dependence on him. Access his power and ask him for direction. The Lord richly bless you in this coming week. Good morning everyone. It is wonderful to be with you, uh, to be able to share with you here online again and what a privilege it is for me to, to lead us in communion. And so let us come around the word from 1 Corinthians 15 and I want to read from verse 3. It says, uh, For I delivered to you, first of all, all which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so, as we come around the table of communion, we remember what it is that Christ has done for us, that He gave His life, He laid it down, He was crucified, so that we might have life to the full. But on the third day He rose again, 
And so we also, with communion, we celebrate the resurrection, that Christ was raised from the dead, and that we serve a God who is truly alive and present in our everyday lives. And so how is it that Paul responds? And so I want to jump to verse 10 here in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, uh, But I labored more abundantly than they all, <clears throat> yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so Paul, he, can, he understood what it is that Christ had done for him, and he lived a life of thankfulness. And he went and he, shined for, he shone forth God's light into the world that he lived in. And so everywhere he went, he proclaimed what it is that Christ has done for him. And so for us too, we should be encouraged uh, as we partake of the communion today, and we remember what it is that Christ had done for us. Uh, it should encourage us again to go live passionately for the Lord uh, wherever we might find ourselves. Uh, to do the things that He has called us to do with passion and live purposely, purposefully for His kingdom. And so let us just pray together uh, before we partake of the bread and we drink of the juice. And so, Father God, we just come before you today. We thank you, Lord, uh, for what it is that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you care for us, that you have saved us. And so, Father, as we partake of the emblems today, we remember what it is that Christ had done for us, that his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us. And so we are so thankful that in him now we can live life to the full. And so, Father, we just, we just thank you, Lord, uh, that we can partake of this communion together and <clears throat> that we can worship you with this life that you have given us. And so, Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, Amen. Thank you very much, all. And so, let us partake of the emblems and let us worship the Lord uh, from our hearts as we do so.